Coming up on this week in computer hardware, NVIDIA GTX 1180 or 2080. Is it time to stop buying new GPUs? Is Microsoft's new Surface Go too slow to bother with? 5G, it's getting real. And AMD's B450 chipset looks like a winner. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 477, recorded on August 2nd, 2018. Surface Go or Surface No? This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most engaging, most affordable, most expensive, most outrageous, most practical hardware news and reviews available in any known or unknown universe. Read that known or heretofore unknown universe line in a contract once, and I've just enjoyed saying it ever <laughs> since. That is the healthy chuckle of Mr. Ryan Trout from PCPerd.com. I, I, we have two exciting stories. Actually, we have more than two exciting stories, but the two that kind of are at the top, uh, one from AMD, one from Microsoft. Which would you like to start with, sir? Uh, let's go with the order as they are presented on the, sh the sheet, I guess. All right. So, uh, tech thing, the show I, uh, the, the, the weekly show I do, uh, uh, T E K T H I N G. We had a viewer question about Ryzen two processors, which are a fantastic value. If you are building your own PC or buying a new PC, which is why they are pretty much all that is recommended on PC Per's leaderboard, their list of system builds. So you need a little help putting together the, the next system you want for gaming or content creation or just general computer usage. Um, and of course, the day after, I talk about the 2600 and the 2600X and the 2700 and the 2700X. And I got to say, if you're looking at Core i5, just buy a Ryzen 2600 or 2600X. Uh, and the, like the day after I do that, uh, Ryzen, <laughs> AMD announces the B450 chipset for Ryzen. And uh, this is basically, the, I mean, the idea is, is a lot of the stories you'll see on this online are, are basically like, AMD makes overclocking more affordable than the 470, uh, which is true. Um, but, you know, there's there's has been other affordable overclocking chipsets uh, for the Ryzen processors, just not that support the latest uh, features in the Ryzen 2 series CPUs. Yeah. Um, but this is, uh, this is pretty good. I mean, first of all, the thing I love the most uh, reading the, uh, the write-up that Josh did uh, over at PC Per, um, this is my favorite line in the whole thing. Quote, AMD plans to support this socket to at least 2020, and most AM4 boards should be able to handle upcoming CPUs with a BIOS update. Which is a polite way of saying, Mr. Norton, we understand that you can't use your first generation motherboard and, and get all of the power benefits of our second generation Ryzen processors. But that's okay, because if you buy a second generation Ryzen processor, your motherboard will go at least through 2020, which is, you know, a year and a half away, which is much better than, say, six months from now. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's kind of, it's you know, the 470 is still the, 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 the top of the line. But when you look at the X470, X370, B450, and the B350 are all... Uh, overclocking enabled. Uh, you got to dip mm -hmm. down into the first generation A320 chipset to get something that doesn't do overclocking. Um, but uh, it's exciting. Um, or maybe I just get excited about chipsets now because we haven't had one in a while. <laughs> no, I mean, I think the 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 interesting thing here is the value proposition that it offers, right? It it, it does. It, the B450 has you know CPU overclocking, memory overclocking supported. AMD Store MI technology, which is their uh, kind of multi-tiered caching. They don't like to use the term caching, but, you know, whatever you want to call it, storage right. system. So you can combine a, an SSD and a hard drive into a single, single faster accelerated unit. Uh, it does not support CPU PCIe bifurcation, which is really something really only targeted at extreme enthusiasts, right? If you're going to have multiple M.2 cards on a single PCIe bus through one of those Asus M.2 
splitters. Um, that's where you really get into that. But uh, if, if you're not doing, if you're not doing M.2 raid, essentially the performance and capabilities are pretty much equitable across the board. Now, the differences right. you may see, there may be other differences you find that are from just the board vendors, board vendors integrating or not integrating specific features on these boards because of their price points, right? If you scroll down right. and you look at, you know, AMD is kind of claiming that the an AMD 450, B450 motherboard is going to be like in the $69, $70 range. Um, That's awesome. Which really sets you up for some interesting comparisons. They compare, you know, a Z370, which um, is still required if you want to go with the Core i5, the, the K series unlocked parts, uh, the 8600 case that they use in this example, um, you know, you can save a hundred bucks if you're going with a, a Raven Ridge. If you want integrated graphics, you're going to get much better integrated graphics performance, uh, the ability to overclock and play around with the with the speeds and feeds on that one. Or if you just want to go towards more performance, you can go up to the Ryzen 5 2600. It's a little bit more expensive processor, and you're still saving about ninety dollars on uh, that entire build out, right? Which is which is Im impressive, right? You're still going to get SATA, NVMe, USB 3.1, Gen 2, uh, PCIe lanes for um, you know add-in cards and what have you. There's there's a there's a lot of value there, and that's uh, that's that's really what AMD is leaning into for this this these mid-range parts. B450 is just an extension of what they were able to do with B350. I think there were a lot of people mm -hmm. that built Ryzen platforms, first gen, that. Just use the B series motherboards, and they don't need the X series. That's, that's you know, can can doesn't always, but can cost you fifty, sixty, seventy dollars more. Right. And uh, on the A on the Intel side, you don't really have that option uh, with their most recent uh, coffee like series of parts. Still, if I were to be cranky, I might suggest that that Intel has done everything it could to complicate the lives of anybody that wanted to upgrade <laughs> by creating as many different motherboard options and dropping them with new processors. But I'm just a little frustrated with Intel in general right now. Um, man, uh, yeah, this is this is good because I was just about to buy a new motherboard and now I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I, may be, I may be looking for a, a, a mini ITX uh, or micro ITX uh, B, B450 instead of the one I was originally going to buy. But this is good. AMD, I mean, I just feel like AMD is just kind of marching along and uh, and doing some really nice work. So, yeah, good stuff. You uh, have a shiny silver 10-inch laptop. Well, it's more of a tablet. I mean, really, it's a Surface it's, Go. Quote, yeah. the best 10-inch device for first-line workers. What's the first that? line worker? That's that's Microsoft. That's off the. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> that's right off okay. the Microsoft.com slash en dash us slash surface slash business slash surface dash go. Keep scrolling down after the happy feet. Keep going. Keep going. Look, it's a surface, but smaller. Honey, they shrunk the surface. Interesting. Oh, wait, so I'll I'll say this. It is the definitely other. small. Right, like, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm trying to think. I have an iPad Pro. It's a 10 inch as well. This, but this because it comes with a keyboard. It, you know, it's, if I take my iPhone 10 and kind of put it on the back of it, you get a sense of, of where you're at on scope and size. It's going to be much smaller than any laptop that most of us are using. It's very light. Um, it's still only well. It has technically it has two ports on it now, right? It has the Surface Connect and it has a, a Type C USB Type C connection as well, uh, and then it has the connection on the bottom for your attachable keyboard. Um, what are your thoughts on what they're trying to do here uh, with this form factor, with this price point? You know, I, I see a lot of people. I feel. I'm going to use, you know, feel. I'm going to, I'm going to tie my statement to me here in the group while everybody's listening. Um, I feel that there are some pretty heavy lines being drawn by the manufacturers, if less so by the actual consumers, where they have this idea that there are these people out there, uh, these consumers, these users, um, these first-line workers that need to display content, do basic email, and have style and portability as their number one needs. And mm -hmm. everything else kind of gets thrown by the wayside. And uh, 
which in some ways makes sense. And you could also say, like, you know, maybe this is their shot across the bow of, of uh, you know, Apple's professional laptops. But um, you know, I, I, I find myself more often than not being frustrated by a lot of these configurations. I mean, first of all, you know, it's four hundred forty nine dollars for a sixty four gigabyte uh, version with four gigabytes of RAM. Um, yep. it's 600 bucks to bump it up to eight gigabytes of Ram. Um, you know, this is, you know, in some ways I look at like a, a, a Dell XPS two in one, the smaller two in one where they use the, the super low power processor. And as long as you don't tax it, it's fine. Uh, and is if your primary need is to do have a very small amount of space uh, afforded to your computing, it's fantastic. Um, right. For me, it gets frustrating because as soon as I try to do a lot of the things I need to do on a daily or weekly basis, um, there's not enough processing power, and, and I get really frustrated really fast. Um, one question I had was, does this – it does include the type cover? No, I don't think it does. Oh, yeah. No, here it is. Okay. The way they, the paragraph is constructed, uh, Surface Go signature type cover and, and then the, the line that's cut off below that uh, says Surface Pen sold separately. Um, so basically, if you want to type on it, it's another hundred bucks. And, uh, right. You know. Which you I will. Because it's still Windows. It, it's still yeah. fundamentally not a fantastic touchscreen only like tablet interface. It's fine right. in some applications, uh, but I would say in general, this is not a this is not a device where you should try to use it without without that keyboard. Um, you know, nine hours kind of, of video you, playback, which does yeah. Not the battery me. life's an interesting <laughs> thing. I haven't we we've had it in for a couple of days. I was out of town, mm -hmm. so I didn't get I haven't spent much time with it yet. Um, but Ken did run our battery life test on it, and it got um, just under five hours in our battery life Ooh. test. And our battery life test is uh, pretty pretty strenuous. It's I consider it to be more realistic for how people actually utilize right. a, a laptop when they're browsing the internet and <laughs> actually getting work done. No, no, it's, I mean, I, I just laugh because there's so many of these battery tests are like, you know, we took a video, loaded it into memory. And then ran it with the screen turned right. most of the way out. And just like you, yeah. we got 13 hours of battery life. And then you actually, you know, you know, start browsing web pages and the battery life cuts by 30 percent, 40 percent. You know, this is I, I'm, I'm with you. This is I, you know, I think this is OK. First of all, I'm going to say this flat out. I don't think Microsoft's doing a great job with the Surface hardware right now. Uh, at least at the high end. I think the middle stuff is pretty good. Um, I think at the high end, at least in some of the models I've seen, uh, the performance is, has just not been anywhere near uh, justifying the cost. Or the, the cost yeah. is so high, the performance is just completely unacceptable. Um, I have not seen or heard of a firmware update that fixes that like we had uh, you know, with the MacBooks that came out a couple, three weeks ago. Um, so maybe there's a thermal profile that, that helps increase the performance on those. But uh, you know, I look at this and I see a stylish, easy to manage, low power, basic laptop that is going to be an accessory or a sales tool or maybe they plan to have it integrated into enterprise environments in a tablet mode. Um, you know, I think it's compared to a lot of the the Android and, and Apple tablets. I think it's, you know, you got to really love windows <laughs> and you got to, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's the whole <laughs> four gigabytes of windows, four gigabytes of windows. I was, I was just talking to someone yesterday about how amazing it's been, because for it was about 18 months, we kept seeing these entry level premium laptops, whether it was, you know, an HP, I want to say an HP Envy or some of the Lenovo's or Yoga's or, or uh, in the Dell XPS 13, where they had this fantastic deal, but it was four gigabytes of RAM and you couldn't upgrade it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you would yeah, end you up with this device that. that was almost useful um, right. or would would frustrate the snot out of you. Now, you could argue that Microsoft has, has issues with the footprint on its operating system, or you can argue that a four gigabyte configuration is just dumb. Um, you know, I mean, this is, you know, it's good looking if you like the Surface Go looks, and I, I like the way they look. Um, yeah, I agree. You know, uh, you know, they, they, 
you know, EMMC, 64 gigabytes of EMMC is not going to help with that four gigabytes of RAM. You know, the 10 inch display probably looks gorgeous. Hey, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, you know, I, I'll say the so the battery life concerns me when because typically right. when you're thinking of a, dice, a device this size, kind of underperformance. Not that it's awful, but it's underperforming compared to traditional notebooks that you can get. Usually, the the benefit you get from going to that hardware is like extended battery life, right. uh, and you don't at least at first blush you're not going to get that with this device. They they only they only put a 26 watt hour battery in this machine, which is you know, it's small and it's light, and there you go. Now you know right. why it's super light because because they only put a 26 <laughs> watt hour battery in it. Um, I will say, you know, browsing around in it, it has it has a very similar problem that we saw with the first generation of the uh, Snapdragon based machines. Mm -hmm. In Edge, things work pretty well. In Chrome, scrolling with your finger on this is a little bit stuttery, right? It doesn't feel like uh, the same type of performance that you're used to seeing. So. Um, that was my main concern when I saw the announcement was the use of that right. particular, you know, those Intel Pentium processors now, which are really just Atom processors. Um, and then battery life, If since they only claimed nine hours on video, and that's something that usually we see on notebooks claimed at like 18 or 20, and then, you know, take your 40% hit on, on it for real world use. I knew it was going to be an interesting mix. So it's, you know, I've we saw a couple of reviews this morning that used the term uh, like essentially all day battery life. And I just think that's uh, wrong. I think that's, that's very right. disingenuous from what we've seen so far. So um, not that it's not going to be a fine product. I'm going to use it for free for a few more days. I'll probably take it on my next trip as well. And just try to see what it works, what it's like. I think this would be more interesting if it were an LTE, kind of one of those always connected devices to begin because of the portability. That's, that's, that's just, it's what my mindset is now um, is that it's portable. You take it with you. It's always connected. It's going to have really good battery life. And that's something that, right. you know, despite not selling like gangbusters that the Qualcomm windows machines have at least changed the, the dialogue and the discussion a little bit in that direction. Hmm. Yeah. And I also got to say is there's going to be a lot of really impressive six seven hundred dollar machines coming out this fall that are traditional laptops um you know they may not be in the premium tier but it seems like everybody is pushing a lot of, of what you would consider premium features down into the more affordable uh you know laptop ranges and there's going to be performance like i said like eight gigabytes of ram is standard you know really good looking screen um a decent amount of storage and you know yeah, I, I just think this is going to be a, a tough sell. Um, yep, agreed. So that's it for the Surface Go, I think. <laughs> for <laughs> Let's now. talk about rumors. Um, you pulled up an article, WCCF Tech, Intel Core i9 9900K, Core i7 9700K, Core i5 9600K, CPUs launching in October, HEDD Core X refresh launches same month too. Um HKEPC uh, uh, pushed a roadmap online. Uh, basically, the ninth generation Intel processors launching in October, and uh, you know, which may or may not actually happen. Um, you know, basically performance skews. Uh, you know, the Core i5 9600K is just an odd part if this is how it actually specs out because they're saying six cores, six threads. i7 9700K eight core eight thread. i9 9900K eight core sixteen thread. Um, this is curious. Um, you know, they're looking at like 3.6, or they're claiming for the 9900K, 3.6 gigahertz base clock and a 5 gigahertz boost clock in single and dual core operations. Mm -hmm. 4.8 gigahertz for four core boost, uh, and then 4.7 for six and eight core boost. Um, so if they legitimately hit that across all eight cores, uh, WCCF Tech says that, quote, this is the highest frequency we've seen on an eight-core part across all cores. And this is all done in a 95-watt package. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we haven't seen a 95-watt. It feels like I know we've had, but it just, it just, it's just after all the laptops we've looked at, um, that just seems like a huge amount of wattage. Um, right. does, this, does this pass the smell test for you? I was just, I mean, I got to say I was shocked. Like, the, you know, i7, 9700K, eight cores, eight threads. Um you know, interesting so, choice. Yeah. Yeah. If that, that, 
So, I, yeah, I don't know. So the fact that they're, they would move up to Core i9 for this is interesting. They, they already did it on the mobile side, so it kind of makes sense. Um, they, they went from, so they're basically, they're actually increasing core count but reducing thread count, right? So the current, right. you know, 8700K, six cores, 12 threads, going up to eight cores, eight threads is probably going to be better performance for the majority of people, right? You're going to get mm -hmm. eight full threads, you know, eight full cores uh, without having to get into the hyper-threading mess. Um, the 9900K, eight, eight by 16, it was basically there. I mean, this is, it makes sense, right? Intel would want right. to match what Ryzen has done. Uh, AMD put a lot of pressure on Intel to increase its core count. So that would be over the course of two generations, Intel would be going from a their top-level part being quad-core hyper-threaded to eight-core hyper-threaded, mm -hmm. um, which is a win for everybody, right? Not Maybe not great for AMD. They lose that advantage that they had for a while. Uh, but instead, what they can get now is they get the, the ability to say that they push this forward and that they're going to be able to continue to do that in the upcoming generations. So, um, But I do think if this if that's true, if those clock speeds are right, that's pretty impressive stuff. And I think the 9900K would be a really, really compelling part. I'm also curious how Intel would price it. Are they going to... If you look at the R7 2700X today, it's what, 349, 329, uh, and that's their eight core part, currently priced up against just a little bit below actually the 8700K. So right. would they be willing to sell the 9900K at that same rate? I kind of doubt it. I think they'd probably <laughs> go for 399, maybe 449 or something like that, knowing that their single threaded performance is better, that they're going to maybe hit some better clock speeds. Um, and, and kind of and lean on. Look, the 8700K is still a wildly successful part, right. uh, despite the fact that the Ryzen family is out there. So that sounds pretty interesting. They also had in that story some notes, I think, about um, was it in there the 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 18 core refreshes coming in the same time period this year, mm -hmm. um, but uh, nothing new on the you know potential for like 28 core processors. It would be a totally different socket, a totally different platform, right? Um, and uh, you know, we'll much, say, like, more, the, the much more complex. Basin Falls refresh Core X processors, X299 refresh motherboards. The embargo lists up to 18 core processors with TDPs up to 165 watts, and then. Um, Quote, we are also expecting a 22-core model, while the 28-core processors would be introduced with the premium high-end family on the LGA 3647 socketed platform. So I'm going to assume, since we're talking about this, uh, you have not received an NDA from Intel for Correct. any of this. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. There you go. All rumor, because if he had been silent while I read that article, that would be a sign that it's... Yep. Uh, Something's actually happening. Uh, while we're on the rumor mill, or while we are, you know, picking up grain at the rumor mill, there's some metaphor. There's some segue in here that I'm failing miserably at. Uh, 9 to 5 Mac reports uh, Icon found in iOS 12 shows iPad with thin bezels, no home button or notch. And uh, if you spend a lot of time looking for the future of uh, Mac hardware, often... Uh, Often uh, it is found in the developer betas, and it, basically they've been expecting an update to the iPad Pro line later this year. And if you look at those icons side by side, one of those things is not like the other, which means who knows? We may have new iPad Pros, and they may not have a home button, which would be interesting. And uh, the uh, I thought it was kind of exciting. Uh, 5G is getting more real. Um, you know, we've been... We've been hearing about 5G for long enough. It's it's hit that point where there's 5G's announced and then there's 5G, like a giant pile of 5G news at, at Mobile World Congress or, or uh, you know, CES. And and then there's, you know, nothing. And then you realize it's like two or three decades out. Um, and then there's more news. And then there's some of the news is, is that people are in trials and they're testing. And finally... This was up on Reuters uh, yesterday. Uh, T-Mobile's picking up $3.5 billion worth of Nokia uh, gear. They're calling it the world's first big 5G award. <laughs> and when they say award, they mean contract. And uh, as far as we know, it is the biggest 5G deal that's been made. And, uh, and uh, that T-Mobile's probably starting to move fast. Uh, on uh, bringing 5G to their network. So, um, 
it's interesting. You know, uh, the uh, T-Mobile basically says they're going to deliver the first nationwide 5G service and uh, probably a big help to Nokia's bottom line. It's a big chunk of change coming from uh, coming from uh, T-Mobile. But, uh, yeah, they're going to use the Airscale radio access platform along with cloud-connected hardware, software, and acceleration services. And yep. uh, it's interesting. Basically, uh, uh, Nokia, Huawei, and Sweden are uh, are uh, battling it out at that uh, corner of the industry. And, and speaking of Huawei, uh, Huawei uh, has passed Apple as the second largest phone manufacturer in the world. And uh, unfortunately, the story got accidentally erased. But uh, this is the first time since 2010 Apple hasn't been the number one or number two in worldwide phone sales. And uh, I thought it was crazy. Just to throw out a number to give you an idea of how many phones are sold worldwide, um, there were 342 million phones sold in the second quarter of 2018. That's a lot of phones. <laughs> uh, yep. You know, I mean, we, we talk a lot about, you know, we, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, how and why, uh, you know, the uh, ARM processors kind of took over the universe. And, and that's a big part of it. That's just a lot of phones. Um <laughs> And that's probably not even a big quarter, but uh, no, Q2 we'll is little, usually uh, a down quarter for everybody. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I just, I just, I just, you know, it's one of those things like 342 million phones. It's a lot of phones, people. <laughs> the cell phone just, market is dying. Hey, well, you know, we'll talk about that in a second because uh, a lot of uh, uh, their their sales are actually down in a lot of areas, but. First, ladies and gentlemen, we should talk about making your life a little simpler, a little bit better, a little bit easier, especially if you're buying a home. If you've ever bought a home, if you're thinking about buying a home, if you are contemplating buying a home, you, you need to know about uh, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. Um, rising interest rates, you know, it's finally happening. It makes things unpredictable when you're buying a, buying a home. Um, People are getting uptight. And it, we're not talking about like the interest rates from the 80s where it was like 13%. But interest rates have been as low as they've ever been for a long time. They're creeping up. And it's like, oh, oh goodness, should I rush? Should I buy the wrong house now in case it's too expensive later? Um, our friends over at Quicken Loans, they're, they're trying to make things easier. They're trying to do something about that. And they're calling it the power buying process. Let me explain how it works. Quicken Loans, they're going to verify your income, your assets, your credit, less than 24 hours to give you a verified approval, which essentially gives you the strength of a cash buyer. Once you're verified, you qualify for their all-new exclusive rate shield approval. They'll lock you up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It gets better. This is the best part. I mean, this is great. If your rates go up, your rate stays the same. But if rates go down, your rate will also drop. It's great. I mean, either way you win. So to get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash twit. We want to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of the show. <sighs> It should be easier to buy a home. So, yeah, you know, we were talking about smartphones uh, before the break. Thank you, Rocket Mortgage. Um, overall market worldwide down 1.8% in Q2 2018, um, you know, which is not a lot. But, uh, yeah, Huawei's market share, 15.8%, uh, 54 million units. And uh, that's... Uh, Huawei's doing pretty good. Um, Samsung's still number one, um, and it's crazy. Like they've they're down uh, ten percent in sales from twenty seventeen, but uh, they are still far ahead of everybody else. So, it'd be interesting to see what happens when the Galaxy Note nine hits in a few weeks. So, um, Xiaomi is now ahead of Samsung in India, <laughs> and uh, I think Oppo is slowing down a little bit, but. It's pretty crazy. Um, it's interesting because, you know, the, 
the Chinese market is where everybody's talking about the growth coming from. Uh, and I think what you're seeing, what you may see now after some of this is that that actually is going to let's lean into India. Let's lean into some <laughs> other emerging markets uh, where yeah. the growth capability is still kind of undisputed and, and will, you know, accept will happen mm -hmm. in some kind of exceptional rate. Um, well, it's but it's crazy. interesting you put that. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's it's crazy when you look at some of these numbers, right? Because um, one, China is going down. We'll talk about that. Or China, phones, sale, phone sales in China are definitely declining. But when you look at the year-over-year -year changes from like 2017 to 2018, Huawei's up 40%. Um, Xiaomi's up 48.8%. Um, you know, it's also crazy when you realize there's a whole bunch of phone manufacturers that don't make the, you know, once you get past Samsung, Huawei, Apple, Xiaomi, uh, Oppo, um, you know, the rest of the, another 33.2% of the market is every other cell phone manufacturer out there. Yeah. So, um, and when you look at the raw numbers just for, for Q, the second quarter, 2018, Samsung, 71.5 million phones, Huawei, 54.2 million phones, Apple, 41.3 million phones, Xiaomi, 31.9 million phones, Oppo, 29.4 million phones. Um, that's, 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 this is again, like, you know, not to sound like, the sophomore that's been drinking too much on Friday night, but that's just a lot of phones. It's, it's amazing. That's just one quarter, the slow quarter. Yeah. I'll stop now. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I look at that sometimes I, and I'm like, I think it's worth people. mentioning as well. The, uh, the, the story you linked in there about the Apple phone. So they did their earnings, you know, now they're a trillion dollar company. Um, iPhone sales were down 1% uh, from last year at this time. Um, but, you know, they, they talk about the, the iPhone 10 was still the best selling phone in Q3, uh, customer satisfaction, 98%, whatever, nobody cares. But <laughs> what I found was most interesting was that their, the average, the price of the average iPhone they sold went up $124 this quarter. Yeah. So it went from like 606 to, you know, seven, whatever, 725 or 730. And, um, so even though they sold fewer units, mm -hmm. they had higher revenue in that quarter than than last year uh, because people were spend were willing to spend more on that iPhone. And it's I was seeing some people talk about it as as Apple's stock was hitting over this one trillion dollar mark today. Right. That uh, hey, remember when people were talking about the release of ninety nine dollar Android phones and how smartphone was going to be this commoditized market and. Apple was going to suffer because of it because they, they weren't going to want to make $99 iPhones and they, they weren't going to reduce that. They have completely bucked that trend and if anything, dragged everybody up with them, right? So right. if Apple can charge $1,200 for a phone, then Samsung feels like they can and you know HTC and LG and those guys feel like they can raise their prices a little bit along the way too. And I'm, you know, I, I am guilty of this kind of uh, two-way street of thinking where I believe the idea of paying $1,200 for a smartphone is kind of insane. However, I buy $1,200 smartphones. Um, <laughs> and somebody, I was talking with somebody back and forth on Twitter about it, and he made a good point of like, you just got to stop. They're not just, they're just not a phone anymore. You're not buying a phone. You're buying your most compact, most portable computer that has full-time connectivity, and you do more with it than almost any other device in your life. It's like, you know, and, and, and that's that's very true. So... We will eventually peak out on how much, how much uh, a sizable audience is willing to spend on these devices, but we're clearly not there yet. And mm -hmm. so, it'd be crazy for us to think that Apple's next phone is going to be any cheaper. And if anything, it may be more expensive. Right? I, on one hand, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not arguing. But you know, the reason I'm I'm playing around with a a, a Moto G6 and and thinking about a OnePlus Six is because I don't want to spend. Eight hundred dollars for you know for another phone when I can get mm -hmm. staggeringly good performance uh, for considerably you know half as much or a third as much or a quarter of as much. Now the the camera yeah you know, don't get me wrong like a, a Moto G six um, is the camera is nowhere near as good as a flagship from uh, Samsung or Apple or or you know Google for that matter and even uh, it's not as good as a second tier phone probably from Google or Apple or Samsung, but 
you know, especially the OnePlus 6, it's some pretty amazing camera performance compared to the phone I've been carrying for the last couple of years. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, like I'm with you, it's this super incredibly important tool that's with you all the time. Um, and, and it dominates your life and your computing and your navigation and your, your media consumption and all that other stuff. Um, but it's still a thousand dollar fragile thousand dollar brick that's easy to lose or break. And I got to be honest with you, you know, when they keep getting thinner and thinner on the flagships, like I, I, I didn't mean to be the guy that breaks all the screens, but <laughs> man, <laughs> you know, it gets really expensive. Now I've, I've got a formula of, of a tempered glass cover and I've figured out sort of a, you know, a case style that's kept me from, from breaking any more screens on my phone, at least until I of course walk out of here, or shift my butt in the wrong direction and crack it in half. But the, uh, you know, I'm a little frustrated with the thinness. I'm a little frustrated with the pursuit of of certain aesthetics over durability. Uh, repairability is still a nightmare on a lot of this stuff. And I, I'm curious, right? I'm curious how far they can push it. Um, because, boy, for some of these flagship, flagship phones, I mean, you can get a really nice laptop. Um, now, obviously, yeah. you're not going to carry a laptop with you, and you're not going to get 4G LTE. But, you know, I also have things to say about... Uh, you know, being a large data consumer professionally and how impossible it's getting to get large amounts of data on a new, uh, if I like to move carriers, I'm going to lose basically any opportunity to deal with like typically in a bad month, like a CES month, I do 25, 30 gigabytes of data. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, I'm going to have to, I'm basically going to have to buy another you know, I'm going to have to buy a special phone or hotspot just to deal with that at CES this year. Because if I do change uh, carriers, none of them are, are particularly interested in large data consumers anymore. And they're going out of their way to sort of minimize the opportunity for that. Even if you want to pay out of pocket, they don't want to create the opportunity for you to do so. so. I mean, eventually they're not going to have a choice, right? Like eventually everybody will be a high data consumer. That's just... That's just the way it's going to be, but the question right. will be: Will our will the will the people at the you know top ten percent always remain at the top ten percent, or will it homogenize a little bit down? So, um, if you would just stop downloading all those movies and stuff, uh, Patrick, we'd be fine. Yeah, it's it's the uploading like three gigabytes to to YouTube that's the problem. Yeah. China smartphone market decline for the fourth consecutive quarter into Q2 2018. That's uh, Counterpoint Research uh, wrote this one up. Uh, quote, Huawei was the fastest and lone brand registering a positive 22% year-over-year growth, leading the market with an all-time record share. Huawei's sub-brand Honor also individually surpassed Xiaomi in overall volumes during the quarter, leading the e-commerce channel share as well. Um, this is... Uh, yeah, it's it's funny. They uh, smartphone shipments in China quote declined seven percent annually, but grew sequentially, and the top five brands captured eighty four percent of the market. Um, essentially, it's a, an analyst write up. James Yan wrote this up for Counterpoint. Um, Huawei, Oppo, Vivo, Xiaomi, and Apple uh, combined did eighty four percent of the market. Did I just read that right? Math is hard. Um, yeah, eighty four percent of the market. Uh, up from uh, like 72% of the market last year. And Oppo's down 9%, Vivo's down a percent, Xiaomi's down 10%, Apple's basically holding at 8 or 9% of the Chinese market. And everybody else dropped 37%. So I wonder if we're finally seeing a lot of the smaller cell phone vendors um, being beaten out of uh, uh, contention uh, in China and the rest of the world. But uh it was interesting. I just thought that was kind of interesting. The place where everybody's like, that's where all the memory's going. That's where all the sales are going. That's why That's why you can't buy memory anywhere. Um, but uh, so I'd be curious to see if if, sale, if, if, I, if phone sales in China keeps going down. It makes me wonder if we're going to start seeing some easing on the memory prices. Um, you know, I also really can't wait for Samsung's memory faps to come along. And I was really excited because one of them actually, I think they flipped the switch on it uh, in... Uh, uh, July 4th. One of the, we talked about earlier this year that uh, Samsung would be running new fabs online and uh, memory fabs. And one of the first ones to come online uh, is a fourth generation VNAND or 64 layer VNAND uh, factory adding to the company's leading capacity for cutting edge memory products. So I was kind of excited until I realized that uh, 
64 layer VNAN is not PC memory, uh, it's SSD memory. And uh, the, the upside of that is we'll probably be creeping closer to Ryan's theoretical ideal SSD price of 10 cents per gigabyte. So we got we're very that close. To we're still, we're still very close. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was actually reading an article uh, earlier about um, the price of NAND memory trending down over the last few months. Uh, the uh, outlet called DRAM Exchange, kind of an analyst group that, that follows, follows things uh, in the memory space really closely, expecting a drop of 10% in Q3 and another 10% drop in Q4 of this year, citing lower market demand and increased output as the reason behind the price drop. Um, so, you know, bad for the stocks of maybe like Samsung and Hynix and, and Micron in the short term, but uh, mm -hmm. better better for the consumers, better for the for the implementers that are, you know, buying this memory and putting it on new devices. Um, so, yeah, I think we always kind of knew this would occur, right? We were at, we were at a high point once more capacity came online, things, things would settle down. I still think we have spikes in demand coming as, mm -hmm. as more IoT devices and AI devices start coming online themselves. Yeah. We'll, we'll see some of that. Uh, but, hey, you know, it's nice to know that uh, these companies didn't just leave their new fabrication facilities offline in perpetuity to maintain high price points. Right. It's a plus. We appreciate that, memory manufacturers. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy, <laughs> you know, when you when you look at, you know, uh, 16 gigabytes, of, like Corsair Vengeance LG, uh, LPX, 16 gigabytes, two 8 gigabytes, 6 of DDR4, 3,000 megahertz. Um, that was down around, uh, you know, summer of 2016, you were looking at 70 bucks for 16 gigabytes of RAM, more typically uh, anywhere between uh, January and uh, January 2016, almost all the way through December of 2017, um, or maybe uh, early 2017, you're still looking at 100 bucks for 16 gigabytes. And then, uh, man, uh, spring of 2017, the memory prices just started climbing up and up and up, peaked out at, at you know, in excess of two hundred dollars for sixteen gigabytes, uh, right around Christmas this year, and you know they're vacillating a lot, uh, anywhere between one hundred sixty and one hundred eighty dollars, depending on what day you're buying. Um, but uh, you know that's still more than twice what it was at the bottom, um, but it's much better than three times what it was <laughs> at the bottom. So we got that to look forward to. Uh, Goodness, SK Hynix building more fab uh, capacity too. Um, and Antec's got a write up on that. Uh, basically, they announced last week they're going to be building another semiconductor fab uh, in uh, Ichion, South Korea. Hopefully, I said that right. Um, you know, three point one three billion to put that puppy together, and uh, uh, so. It looks like I don't think they've gotten too specific about what's going to happen at the fab, um, but uh, man, they've got a lot of DRAM and NAND capability there <laughs> across all of their uh, across all of their factories. Basically, they they said they're going to build a new fab, but just not going to say what uh, what they're going to build there, and they're going to wait until quote they can consider future market conditions. So. Mm. You know, they want to secure a future growth engine and they want to take advantage of high memory prices, but they're going to wait as long as possible till they commit themselves to whatever memory is going to make them the most money out of that warehouse. So, um, GTX, yep. we, we had uh, GTX 1170 rumors in the last show. We're now having GTX 1180 rumors. And did you say a GTX 2080? Well, I think I think the debate is still going back on whether or not they're going to call it the GTX 1180 or GTX 2080 or something else it, it completely. Because depending on which website you read on which hour, uh, they're going to have a slightly different <laughs> rumor and story about uh, about all these types of things. So this just happened to be the most recent one that I saw. They're calling it the 1180. There are rumors that I saw this morning of uh, uh, of a Hong Kong based outlet registering uh, a product called Ampere, and it was called the 2080. So uh -huh. that name hadn't come up in a little while. We had been hearing Volta and Turing, and now Ampere spike, uh, spikes back up again. The new stuff in here are these PCB shots that apparently leaked out. Now, what's interesting is they show there's some things you can tell. It's literally only a PCB. There's no GPU on it. There's no memory on it. Um, the SLI connection or NVLink connection is different. It's unique from some, anything we've seen previously. 
Uh, even NV Link is is flipped in slightly different pin count than that. This mm-hmm. has an eight pin plus six pin power connection, so giving you an idea that you know the, the GTX 1080 is just one eight pin. So this is going to be higher end than that, either in terms of pricing or performance or both. Um, we also you all, all the stories are assuming this is a GeForce product. It could be um, a a workstation class product. It could be a Volta based product. This this could literally be just just about anything um but all those all that aside this is the whole point of the speculative rumor mill that that is a that is sometimes fun sometimes frustrating to watch is that you know they're talking about eight gigs or 16 gigs of memory gddr6 memory on it uh they call them new sli fingers i don't like that term but it's sli interconnect (laughs) (laughs) um hey it is what it is uh yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting. And and again, according to this story, the release will be the 1180 would be August 30th. The 1180 plus would be September 30th, 1170 September 30th, and 1160 October 30th. So kind of spreading those out a little bit. Um, 1180 plus is kind of interesting. It's a, it would be a new nomenclature. I don't know if they just don't want to say 1180 Ti with that anymore, but you know. Plus seems plus seems a little odd, but we'll see. We wait with bated breath. Hopefully, not much longer. <sighs> I mean, are you feeling it's time to warn people to not buy a oh, premium man. GPU? <sighs> <sighs> probably. I think. I think. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Um. I, Yes, I'll just say yes. We're already in August, and Nvidia is having an event at Gamescom where they've, you know, apparently invited people out, and there's all these rumors are percolating with August 30th dates for for some of that. But I have no idea. I, I, I still, I would, I would bet that Nvidia would be raising prices along with performance to some degree as well. So if you find a good deal, you know, a 1080 and a 1070. 1070 Ti, those are still fantastic gaming cards. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're all the 1060, the, the 1060, the 1070, the 1080. Um, they're all phenomenal performers. I don't think, I, do you anticipate anything that's going to make you sort of bang your head against the desk and be like, I should have waited. It's 70% faster. It costs half as much. It'll yeah. polish my shoes. <laughs> Probably not. Um, I mean, the, the 1080 jump was was pretty significant as it is. I would be surprised if we see that big of a jump, but it has been two years, right? Like it's been yeah. it's been a pretty long wait. So it wouldn't it wouldn't blow me out of the water if we're seeing 40 percent out of it. Wow. Yeah. So the question is, it will be 40 percent for the same retail MSRP right. or street price, or will it be 40% for a significantly increased MSRP and street price? Yeah. We'll let you know as soon as we figure it out. Um, in other uh, news, since we seem to be talking, it's, it's everybody's been announcing, uh, doing their financials and stuff. Um, uh, I've never seen this website before. This is insider.com, but, uh, uh, well, I guess it's business. It's sort of a corner of Business Insider I've never been on before. Um, but uh, Apple sold 13% fewer Macs this quarter, proving that its future hinges on iPhone and iPad. And, uh, mm. you know, it's 13% uh, over the same quarter in 2017. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really kind of curious, uh, you know, I'm kind of curious uh, how things look at the end of the year for sort of uh, uh, MacBook uh, sales and and I you know it's it's interesting right uh, 3.7 million uh, units sold on you know across the Mac lineups that's down nine percent from the quarter before uh, again this is a kind of a, a, a short quarter for the year uh, for most years. Um, 
thirty-two percent fewer than the same period in twenty seventeen. Five uh, right. percent drop in MAC revenue from the same period in twenty seventeen. And you know, we've talked about it not so much in the last year, but there were a couple of years there where it seemed like every week there was some new study basically explaining how no one was going to be using uh, laptops next year and that nobody was really using desktops now except for a few obscure programmers and 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 media creation people <laughs> um so you know uh the death of the pc uh is going to be much more slow and gradual than i think a lot of the the more hyped up reports would say and, and may actually never happen um but it's it's interesting right you know there was so much trouble with the 2016 models of the macbook pro um they launched the, you know, the 2018 models there's some issues with that um you know the keyboard. I think the keyboard fails kind of drove off a lot of people. But the the interesting thing is that they're pointing out here is that uh, you know 3.7 million Macs um, that quarter, 41.3 million iPhones, and uh, you know the in the suggestion, the 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 thought they're having at, at Business Insider is that um, developers are not going to be as stoked for developing on the the you know mac os uh as they would be for ios due to the sheer volume uh, of customers that are available mm -hmm. now i i think there's a pretty diehard community and a lot of people that are fully vested in their macs but you know i've had a lot of people in the last six months um you know ask me about moving from os 10 to windows and and what that would entail because they've been so frustrated with the hardware situation at apple and uh Apple certainly got the money, and 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 since they got called out on the willingness, for example, to update the keyboards uh, on the older Macs that had such a tremendously awful keyboard design. But you know, the other thing they're kind of suggesting is is that you know maybe they're just not doing as good a job engineering the laptops as they used to in the past because most of their focus is on the phones. Um, I'm really curious. Uh, you know, it's 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 been a long time. You know, it's Content and apps and and iPhones have been the vast majority of 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 what generated revenue uh, at Apple for a long time. This is not exactly news, mm -hmm. but I'm very curious to see what Apple does over the next couple of years because it seems like they've made a lot of tremendous mistakes around what I think is a pivotal uh, content creator uh, tool. You know the the MacBook, the MacBook Pro. Um, I'm kind of really curious to see because you know they how could they have not figured out the TDP problems before releasing this MacBook. You know, they fixed them fairly quick, which means they should have, you know, <laughs> either they knew what was going to happen and launched it anyway because they were almost done with the repair, or nobody there bothered to actually do any any real testing with, with strenuous apps. You know, I don't, I don't know how to respond to that. That's just... It's not the apple we grew up with. It's not the apple of my father. Um, you know... <laughs> Uh, it's, it's not the apple of my youth. I mean, I'm curious, you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, you know, they're selling probably more smartwatches than anybody else on the planet right now. Um, iPhone sales are doing pretty good. But I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where they are with the rest of their hardware in a year or two. And uh, if you're really excited about uh, really dense spreadsheets, you can actually look at... Uh, <laughs> You know the the revenue breakdowns like you know forty one point three million iPhones. Uh, man, that's is that units that revenue made twenty nine, uh, almost thirty. It can't be right. Thirty, I think it would be thirty billion in revenue. Could that be right? I'm having trouble reading this spreadsheet's so small I can't read it. Um, but you know, twenty nine. Yeah, it's just it's just you're looking at like one. Six the revenue, um, yeah. services generates twice as much money as the Mac. Other products generates nearly as much money as the Mac. iPads generate, uh, you know, almost as much. Maybe a, you know, a, it's just like it's like maybe fifteen percent less. Like iPads. What's the last time you saw somebody buy a new iPad? Um, in any case, interesting to watch uh, the goings on in Apple. Um, if you're seeing Nintendo Switches everywhere, it's because they are. Um, 
compared to the Wii, this thing is is staggeringly popular. Uh, 19.7 million consoles racked up, 87 million games to date. Um, if you are into the Nintendo ROM scene, uh, some developments coming up on the Switch are basically why a bunch of the ROM sites have been legally stomped out of existence. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, this is... Uh, <laughs> they're doing pretty good. Um, little old Nintendo. Um, you know, 19.7 uh, million consoles, which compares that that they've sold so far of the Switch. Uh, the right. Nintendo Wii U sold 13.6 in total. Yeah. Um, but also in comparison, the Nintendo 3DS sold almost 73 million. So, you know, they're within, you know, 20, 25% of the 3DS sales already. I think that's probably... Right more successful than anybody would have guessed at this point in time. It's, yeah, yeah, a lot of money. That's what it is. Yeah, I was going to say, because when you look at the 3DS, the sales on that started February 26th in 2011 and ran for a long time. <laughs> I think they might still be running. I think now they've backed off to the 2DS, but I don't know if yeah. the 3DS is sold anymore, but it was fairly recently. So yes, it had a long run to get up to that number. Um, and it had sustained sales rates for right. almost the entirety of that of that period. And so the switch has done has done better. I know from personal experience that a lot of my friends have been buying them for their kids for their birthdays and stuff. Uh, yeah. it, it's it's kind of the return of that for Nintendo. So yeah, <laughs> they after the They're success of the Wii and the failure of the Wii U, the success here is uh, a welcome change for them. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, the other one that made me laugh, uh, and get, in Gadget's title, Sony can't stop making money from PlayStation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the interesting thing there is in this past quarter in Q2, they sold 3.2 million PlayStation 4s, which is only 100,000 less than they sold during the same period last year, despite the yeah. fact that you know, there's all the rumors circulating about new PlayStations with new processors and faster performance and uh, and all of that. So the fact that they sold 3.3 million in Q2 last year and 3.3 million this year is is pretty impressive. And they apparently sold 40 million games in that yeah. same time period as well. That's, that's, uh, that's a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> $750 million in profit from the PlayStation arm. Yeah. I'd be very curious. I don't know if... Uh, I don't think Microsoft breaks out Xbox into its own. It combines it with some other things. But my guess would be it's not quite not quite to that level. Well, PlayStation 4 is doing all right. And uh, new games for that should be coming for quite some time. Actually, new games for the 3DS should be coming for quite some time, too. So... I don't know. A lot of console news this week, some odd news in hardware, but uh, I thought it was fun to cover because now we know where all the memory's going. Less of it's going into phones in China, more of it's going into phones in India, and a lot of it's going into PlayStations. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, come on, Samsung. Get those new fabs online. Let's drop those memory prices down. Down. Oh, my goodness. Anything you can tease? I mean, other than the, you know, whatever GPU news you can't talk about because lawyers drop from the ceiling with hammers and beat you senseless. But so you'll you talk have, about that's coming up? You, you'll have Threadripper 2 results this month, right? Like Threadripper 2000 series is going to be soon. Um, the, the G4 stuff is happening at the end of the month. I, I don't know when the embargoes are going to be on performance or all that, but if there's new right. products coming out, it will likely be at the end as well. Um and it sounds like like it sounds like September and October are going to be busy too if Intel's uh, leaked roadmaps hold up to a scrutiny as well. So I, I from I don't know. It doesn't seem like we've ever slowed down. This is a lot of it. A lot of this is thanks to AMD and their processor division ever since the release right. of the first Ryzen parts, kind of uh, jumping everybody, leaping them, leapfrogging them a little bit. So everybody's playing catch up and. NVIDIA does not have that pressure, but they're like, geez, I guess maybe we've had these GPUs long enough. We'll probably start to sell them now. So it's good for everybody. <laughs> we've been stopped. Maybe not Radeon, but good for everybody else. Selling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, they could start. If they could. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look at I'll look at GPU prices next week. We'll, we'll take a look at some of the uh, Radeon pricing and availability versus the GTX. But man, it's it's like MSRP and occasionally 
hints of, of below MSRP pricing. And it, I, I was actually kind of shocked at, at how much variance there was in the prices on some of the 1050 Ti and 1060 parts. Um, because we were talking about that on uh, on Tech Thing this week, um, but yeah, if you've you've been waiting to build a system, it's time. Yep. Go to the pcpro.com slash leaderboard. There are many good ideas there. Don't forget, if you're building a Ryzen system, um, you gotta buy a GPU because there ain't no graphics on the chip. Just want to lay that out there. So some of the savings they they talk about so much uh, in the motherboard uh, in the motherboard. Uh, uh, chip combinations does not survive. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're gonna have, you can drop at least like fifty bucks for some kind of a GPU to make sure you can connect a monitor to your computer, unless you want to run headless. And if you're doing that, you're probably some sort of hardcore FreeBSD or Linux guru, and you're probably not listening to this podcast. If you are listening to this podcast, uh, we're called This Week in Computer Hardware, and we are over at twit.tv slash twitch if you want to find all of our older episodes and information on how to subscribe. The handsome man with all the benchmarking knowledge is Mr. Ryan Shrout. You can find him over at pcper.com. My name is Patrick Norton. You can find more of me at techthing, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G, and avxcel.com. And uh, we want to thank you so much for your support of the show. And uh, hey, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch.